So good afternoon, um, everybody. So, so, so my role here is dramatically to, to lower the tone um, by inviting us to spend about 25 minutes um, in, the, in the company of Pulp Colossus and um, uh, jingoistic rotter, uh, Dennis Wheatley. Um, here he is uh, on, the, on, on the right um, on his own ex libris book plates um, that, we have, that was made for him, um, sitting naked um, at the feet of his rather older friend, uh, um, Eric Gordon Trues, um, uh, who seems to be um, in the guise of the Great War. Um, um, uh, Trues died under mysterious circumstances of the um, I suppose my, what, I, what, I'm, what I have to say today is, is, is animated by, by my sense um, that the devil, about whom much more uh, later, uh, um, is in 20th century modernity, um, fundamentally um, a, a creature or a being um, of popular culture. Um, uh, that's where he belongs. Um, uh, official um, uh, mainstream theology, certainly with, with, within the academy, um, has had, I think, relatively little um, to say um, uh, uh, on, on the subject of theodicy. Um, uh, that is of the problem of the existence of evil in the world. Uh, grace, the answers that um, it, it, it has tended to give, um, struck many people as um, slippery or evasive or, or, dis, or, or deflecting into metaphor. Problems, but, but nevertheless, you know, um, 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 the, 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 the devil um, uh, re remains uh, for, for, for many people um, uh, uh, the real embodiment um, of a genuine physical problem, if not a real existing um, entity. So, what this means, I think, is that theology has tended to cede the territory of popular culture to the devil. This is his domain here, where Dennis Wheatley comes in. So, Satanism um, and the occult um, were vivid presences in British popular culture in the middle decades of the 20th century, and easily the most high-profile literary diabolist of his generation was, was, was Dennis Wheatley, um, whose books uh, were a staple of public libraries up to the 1970s. Um, Wheatley was the son of a prosperous Mayfair wine Merchant, supplier of wine, according to their according to their own um, uh, 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 marketing, supplier of wine to three kings, twenty-one princes, uh, and many millionaires. Uh, born in Brixton and educated for a time at Dulwich College, he was expelled. Um, allegedly, he was expelled for um, a membership of an occult secret um, society that he claimed. Um, at any rate, ran off then to join the uh, merchant navy. Um, uh, gained a commission, um, uh, uh, fought uh, with some distinction in the First World War in Ypres, um, was gassed at Passchendaele and delivered out of the war, uh, went into the family business um, thereafter. Um, but Wheatley gentrified himself um, across the course of his life, gradually adopting the persona, the familiar persona, of the smoking jacketed, sobrani smoking, claret drinking man of culture. He is, in fact, in, in, in later years. Um, I'm almost certain that the books behind him are fakes and have, have no actual uh, books inside them. Um, I can never be sufficiently grateful, um, he wrote, um, that elocution lessons did away with my suburban accent and gave me what might be termed an upper class voice. And that is a tremendous asset to anyone. He weekly was a purveyor of a fantasy of culture to working class readers. In one extraordinary moment in The Devil Rides Out from 1934, the occult investigators, the Duke de Richelieu and Rex van Rin, track down an occult secret society to a home in St. John's Wood, break in by climbing through the toilet window, only to pause, unable to resist the contents of a table upon which they stumble. In the salon, the great buffet table lay still spread with the excellent collation which they had seen there on their first visit. The Duke walked over to it and poured himself a glass of wine. I see Simon has taken to Clico again, he observed 
He alternates between that and Bollinger with remarkable consist consistency, though in certain years I prefer Paul Roger to either uh, when it has a little age on it. As Rex spooned a slab of duck a la Montmorency onto a plate, helping himself liberally to the foie gras mousse and cherries, he wondered if de Richelieu had really recovered from the extraordinary agitation he had displayed a quarter of an hour ago, which is what you do uh, when you're being pursued by murderous Satanists. Um, to read Wheatley is to enter into a world of imperial Tokai wine and Hoyo de Monterey cigars. In this way, his pleasures for his large working class readership are similar to those that George Orwell identifies for the school story uh, in his essay, Boys Weekly, the vicarious experience of the other end of the class system. For me, growing up in the 1970s, there was something forbidden about Dennis Wheatley, something adults. In large part, I think this was down to the extraordinarily racy, and in fact downright lurid covers under which his books were sold from the very start. Um, a whole paper on pulp iconography uh, could be written just using uh, Wheatley's covers as an example. Uh, so my grandfather had this edition of They Used Dark Forces, um, which I no doubt encountered far too long. Um, and just to give you, uh, uh, just so you get the picture, here's a few others that have been To the devil, the daughter. To the hell. The Irish witch. Um, an extraordinary scene. Um, oh, and my favorite of all, um, the wanton princess. Uh, I think you get the picture. Um, and if his own best sellers weren't in uh, in the last years of his life, um, Wheatley gave his name to the Dennis Wheatley Library of the Occult, a mass market paperback imprint published by Sphere Books, which ran to 45 volumes, each with a brief introduction uh, by, by this year. And here's um, a, 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 a rather ostentatious uh, marketing flyer for the Library of the Occult. The Library of the Occult uh, was a combination of Gothic classics like uh, Frankenstein and the Monk. Uh, quite a lot of pulp fiction and the odd work of non-fiction, such as um, Blavatsky's studies in occultism and Philip Bonowitz's religion. Wheatley very clearly understood the devil as a figure for his times. For Wheatley, in fact, Satan was or became in the post-war era the ultimate cold warrior. Very consistently across a series of works from, for example, the haunting of Toby Jug in 1948, through the Satanist in 1960 and beyond, Wheatley understood communism as a gigantic satanic plot to control the world. Stalin himself was merely a tool or agent of the devil. One of his best known novels in the 50s, The Car of Gifford Hillary in 1956, is essentially a neo-Victorian spiritualist novel full of out-of-body experiences, astral journeys and fears of premature burial. But it begins with a very long and hawkish account of British Cold War military policy. So long, in fact, um, that Wheatley's narrator feels obliged to interrupt his own narrative on page 22 with an italicized disclaimer, and I quote, any reader of this document who is, in, who is uninterested in future strategy and our measures for countering the threat of Soviet invasion will lose nothing by omitting the next few thousand words and, re and resuming this account on page 40 so you can skip the next 18 continuous pages of British Cold War military policy. Britain weakly seems to be arguing needs a nuclear deterrent in order to combat the satanic forces of evil. His 1971 work of popular scholarship his works, uh, which acknowledges um, the influence of the great Egyptologist and occultist Margaret Murray on some of its ideas, makes very plain with uh, Wheatley's belief that Satan, in fact, controls, uh, creates and controls secular modernity. Um, it's starting to get kind of dark in here, and I'm, I'm unable to read my own uh, pages. <laughs> the lighter. Ah, that's better, yes. My eyes are growing dim. 
So here's Wheatley. We must also consider this new age of unbelief, capital A, capital U. Atheism goes hand in hand with communism. During the past decades, particularly in Russia and China, as the older generations die off, there are ever fewer people who accept the beliefs of their forefathers. This applies to millions in the Western world and among the better educated peoples of the Near East. The decline in the faiths has led to major changes in outlook and conduct by many millions of people, to a repudiation by the young of the authority and possible wisdom of their elders, a seeking of some mental stimulant that will replace accepted religions, and a breaking down of prohibitions that through the ages have protected society for its own good. Whether unorthodox aid is deliberately sought or atheism accepted, the removal of the old barriers against self-gratification has rendered a great part of the new generation vulnerable to temptations which, out of fear or with hope of reward, they would otherwise resist. And nothing can change the laws which, at the time of creation, it was decreed should dominate the lives of human beings. So, we all remain, and must continue to remain, subject to the powers of light and darkness. So according to Wheatley's gloomy prognosis, only conservatism, socially and politically, and a return to the values of the British Empire, only these can save the world. The Devil Rides Out, 1934, was Wheatley's first real foray into the genre of the satanic thriller, which was to make his name and fortune until his death in 1977. Prior to this, Wheatley had been a modestly successful writer of imperial thrillers, heavily influenced, as he was to remain, uh, by John Buchan and Sax Roman. And indeed, for all its occult trappings, The Devil Rides Out is at heart one of the last imperial thrillers. Its sensibilities clearly indebted to Whitley's own childhood favourites, H. Rider Haggard and G. A. Henty. And both Dirichler and Van Ruin, uh, they both allude to a shared background in great game imperial geopolitics, um, as though they'd stepped out of the pages of Buckingham's green mantle. And actually, um, uh, Wheatley wrote relatively few, in a massive over relatively few occult or satanic thrillers, though they were his best known work. Um, he would try his hand at pretty much any genre. Um, he wrote adventure fiction um, in the manner of um, Conan Doyle or, or Edgar Rice Burroughs. Um, he wrote thrillers and spy thrillers. He wrote swashbucklers. Um, but Satanism, of course, was the novel's USP and the subject that was to make Wheatley's career as a 50 million shifting bestseller, 50 million. At around the time that the novel was published in 1934, Wheatley first met Rollo Ahmed, the West Indian occultist, yogi, convicted fraudster, and possible MI5 agent, born Abdul Saeed Ahmed in British Guyana around 18 is liked. Um, Ahmed was an acquaintance of Alistair Crowley, who likely introduced him uh, to Wheatley, and the pair struck up a warm friendship. And after the success of The Devil Rides Out, Wheatley was asked to write a history of black magic, but lacking first hand practical experience, suggested Ahmed for the job, and his study, The Black Art, was duly published in 1936 with a glowing introduction, as you can see, by Wheatley himself, who cites Ahmed as his major source for The Devil Rides Out. Such praise, he writes, as I have received in the most voluminous correspondence from all over the world as to the accuracy of the data in my book, The Devil Rides Out, is almost entirely due to my many long conversations with Mr. Rollo Ahmed. With unfailing patience, he answered my innumerable questions. And in the most generous manner, he places profound knowledge entirely at my disposal in order that I might make my novel a little more than an ordinary fiction book. Rereading the black art whilst researching The Devil and All His Works in the 70s 
Weekly Strike says that he was again amazed at the extent of his knowledge. This knowledge included an extraordinarily lurid account of the Black Mass, which really establishes a pattern for popular moral panics about satanic abuse, real folk demons. He is Ronald Ahmed. Most of the sacrificial victims of the Black Mass were women, but young children and even babies were not exempt. And occasionally men were butchered as well. All were slain with ingenious torture and cruelty, their bowels and entrails being literally torn out. While, when women were the victims, the reproductive organs were chosen as the point of torture. Little children were treated in the same way. The devil, or at least his followers, evidently taking unholy pleasure in the sacrifice of the young. Ahmed's book closes uh, with the assertion, based, he says, on first-hand knowledge, that black magic is an ongoing practice in modern society, and that secret societies of Satanists remain all around us. Satanic cults teach their initiates that, and I quote, evil is only a relative term, that people have evolved to see the beauty in so-called wickedness, that sin has no reality, and that the only way to to a full life is to ignore ordinary standards of honesty, purity, and kindliness, because the exercise of these qualities prevents young people yielding to all their impulses and limits, and limits their material attainments. And soon, these initiates end up wallowing in evil for its own sake. Wheatley was also to make much of his acquaintance with Alistair Crowley, easily the most high-profile occultist of the 20th century, to whom Wheatley was introduced in 1934 by the journalist and future Labour MP and alleged occultist uh, Tom Dryberg. Um, uh, whether or not Dryberg was an occultist, um, uh, he was certainly a, a very active gay man. And I wonder, taking us back uh, to the... To, 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 to the ex Libra's book quite at the beginning, um, uh, whether obviously there are encoded versions of sexual dissidence uh, going on in these things. Crowley and Wheatley seem not to have met often, and certainly were never friends, though Crowley did give Wheatley a copy of Magic in Theory and Practice with a hand-customized title page. This unique copy, published for Dennis Wheatley only, 1934, era of Vulgaris. Crowley makes a refracted appearance in Wheatley's own work. He appears as the bald, as, as the effete, ambiguous Damien Mokata in The Devil Rides Out, but a pot-bellied, bald-headed person of about 60 with large, protuberant, fishy eyes, limp hands, and a most unattractive lisp. He reminded me of a large white slug. Um, so here's, here's Crowley, and, and here is the great Charles Gray as Mokata in, in, in Hammond's uh, uh, 60s version of The Devil Rides Out. There is a barely disguised and completely unsurprising anti Semitism at play here. The Mokatas were a prominent London family. Sephardic Jewish financiers. Um, a visit to the Jewish graveyard at Mile End, um, now part of Queen Mary University, uh, reveals numerous plaques and gravestones of the Makatas. I hope you can see this. So here's a, here's a Makata plaque um, outside Queen Mary University. This stone was laid by Edward Lombroso Makata, Esquire Treasurer. Written in 1934, the novel is certainly aware of Nazism. When Derusula place, places a protective swastika amulet around his Jewish friend Simon Aaron's neck, Rex protests. Fancy hanging a Nazi swastika around the neck of a professing Jew. Derusula counters with a long disposition on the history of the swastika as a religious symbol. But nevertheless, scenes such as this and the anti-Semitic portrayal of Mokata give credence to Phil Baker's belief that The Devil Rides Out is an early example of the literature of Nazi appeasement. 
In the 1950s, Rollo Ahmed, dis disguised as Mr. A, participated in a series of se sensational exposés of contemporary satanic cults for the Sunday Pictorial. It's the cult of many organized groups. They include people who are nationally and internationally famous. At around the same time, Fabian of the Yard, ex-superintendent Robert Fabian of the Metropolitan Police, published London After Dark his own expose of the Capitol's seamy aside with, to quote the back, back cover blurb, it's dope, prostitution, blackmail, low nightclubs, cosh boys and their malls, and all that goes with the murky side of London after dark. This murky side included a private temple of Satanism, exclamation mark, in Lancaster Gate, London W2. At one end of the room, of the long room is an altar, exactly as in a small church, except that the altar candles are black wax and the crucifix is head downwards. Pentagrams and sigils are on the low ceiling. On the left of this altar is a black African idol, the juju, obviously, of some heathen fertility rite. It is nearly five feet high, squat, repulsive, and obscenely constructed. It is rubbed to a greasy polish by the ecstatic bare flesh. In, in June 1956, Reynolds News and Sunday Citizen claimed to have acquired a Scotland Yard file on its investigations into contemporary black magic in London. Peers on the Yard Black Magic list on the headline. The list reads like pages taken from Debrett. It includes two or three of the most famous names in the peerage and that of the former ambassador to the court of St. James. It also names a number of wealthy people including one with two country mansions and a luxurious West End flat. Responding to this sensation, from the 3rd to the 24th of June 1956, the Sunday Graphic ran a series of articles on black magic by, quote, the man who knows more than anyone else about this strange evil cult, Dennis Wheatley himself. Wheatley had clearly been reading Fabian of the Yard. He writes, Yet it is not only in Africa that such abominations are practiced. A few years ago, women were giving themselves up to hideous eroticism with a great carved ebony figure during satanic orgies held in a secret temple in Bayswater, London W2. Clearly, there are in this narrative barely conceived anxieties about the, act the activities of Britain's new immigrant community who from the arrival of the Empire Windrush at Tilton Docks on the 22nd of June, uh, 1948, carrying 492 Jamaican passengers, had become a recent and for some clearly troubling feature of the 1950s English life. To close, begin to close. While in his post war works from Toby Jagg in 1948 onwards, Wheatley understood communism as the master narrative for understanding the occult. His earlier works of the 1930s tend to interpret it in a colonial context where threats to the British Empire come from its own disgruntled imperial others. The Devil Rides Out in 34 opens with a gathering of Satanists presided, presided over by the Ipsissimus Mukata, whose manservant, the heroic Duke de Richelieu exclaims, is a Malagasy, I should think, a native of Madagascar. They are a curious people, half Negro and half Polynesian, this great brute stands about six foot eight, and the one glimpse I had of his eyes made me want to shoot him on sight. He's a bad black, if ever I saw one, and I've traveled, as you know, in my time. Amongst the other colonial grotesques at the gathering are, and I quote, a tall fair fellow, his thin flaxen hair brushed flatly back, and whose queer light eyes proclaimed him an albino, a stout man, dressed in a green plaid and ginger kilt, who was walking softly up and down with his hands clasped behind his back, muttering to himself inaudibly. His wild, flowing white hair and curious costume suggested an Irish bard. A grave-faced Chinaman wearing the robes of a Mandarin, whose slit eyes betrayed a cold, merciless nature. A Eurasian with only one arm, a left, 
and a tall, thin woman with a scraggy throat and beetling eyebrows which met across the bridge of her nose, a fat, oily baboon in a salmon pink turban and gown, and a red-faced teuton who suffered the deformity of a hairy. They are, thinks the Duke, altogether a most unprepossessing lot. Action would close to read weekly writes his biographer, is to study the history of British taste. Already ideologically outmoded at the time of The Devil Rides Out, Wheatley was completely at odds with the world of the post-war settlement and disliked its morality. The Devil and all, its, and all his works gives off a real hatred of young people. And he disliked Hammer's 1976 adaptation of To the Devil a Daughter so much that he forbade the studio from filming any more of his novels. And this is Hammer we're talking about, a notably conservative studio. Indeed, I think this retro, this retro grouchiness was part of his charm. He gave off an air of Edwardian high imperialism in a world of concrete and the welfare state. A, t uh, a taste of weekly provided a mass readership of a vicarious dose of high culture. After his death in 1977, Heron Books published a commemorative edition of his collected books, 52 volumes bound in crimson leatherette with gold lettering. And then, leaving behind him little more than a whiff Soften. He was gone. It's difficult to think of another writer whose reputation died so completely with their own going. The Heron collected edition, which you could buy in monthly instalments from the Sunday supplements, turned out to be his Ozymandias. A couple of weeks ago, I found myself talking to the writer Francis Spufford who is, amongst his many achievements, the editor of The Vintage Book of the Devil, an anthology which contains precisely no selections from Dennis Whitley. I told him that for my next project, I was setting about restoring the reputation of Dennis Whitley. He seemed to think that this was one of my stupid ideas. But I'm not so sure. It's 2016. 